so I'm going to talk to you today about gerasite minerals, uh, which is something that I started working on um, as a postdoc at CSIRO, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, and I realized when preparing these slides that I haven't actually talked about sacks and gerasite for, I think, eight years. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, we'll see what I remember. Um, but hopefully everyone learns something and it's not too overexciting for anyone. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen now. So, gerasite. So this is a lump of gerasite. So before I was a big mine scientist, I was a planetary geologist. Uh, I'm still a planetary geologist. And uh, gerasite is one of my favorite minerals. So gerasite is this lovely, if you're very lucky, it's this lovely sunflower yellow colored mineral. Uh, it ranges in colour from dog poo brown through the lovely sunny yellow to, let's say, mossy green. So you've got a full range of very nice colours there. Um, so if you want to get a little bit more technical, gerasite, uh, pure gerasite is a potassium iron sulphate hydroxide. Um, so you've got these planes of iron octahedra, which are joined at the corners by sulfate tetrahedra and then you get the cations that kind of sit in the holes in between and you can change a lot of things in the structure so you can put you can swap out the potassium so you most regularly you would swap you would put um, either sodium or hydronium in there um, you can swap the iron out for aluminium um, you can put gold in there you can put lead in there you can put arsenic in there a whole host of really lovely things um, and so there's a lot of flexibility in this structure and you find it in a lot of um, terrestrial environments. So here is uh, a lovely, one of my lovely field sites where I've gone to collect some gerasite. Uh, so this one is down at the Mornington Peninsula, which is just down from Melbourne around the bay. Um, it's a very lovely spot. This happens to be a dog beach also, which is great. Uh, so my two sites are Mornington on one side of the bay and then Southside on the other. So Mornington is a dog beach and Southside is a nudist beach. So it's fun, whichever one you go to. Um, and you get a lot of different, uh, vari you get a lot of variation in Jarrah sites, um, even at those two sites. So this is just uh, some pictures from, of the different Jarrah sites of the two sites that we go to, you can see you get this really powdery gerasite, you get kind of sludgy, muddy gerasite, you get these nice little uh, little nodules, um, which kind of look a little bit like blueberries, but that's something we'll probably talk about later. Um, you get these slightly bigger nodules, um, you get these big concreted nodules that are kind of stuck in the cliff, you get this gerasite that just forms on the outside, you get the veins of gerasite, you get really nice crystalline gerasite, it's everywhere, it's everything, it comes in all different forms. Why does it do that? Um, so I'm a planetary geologist, and while I do, the Earth is a planet, it's fine. I do care about, um, about the Earth a lot. Um, and you can see in those coastal regions that it's really, understanding gerasite is gonna help to, um, to preserve those coastal regions. Um, and especially around the bay here in Melbourne, we've got quite a lot of, um, ecosystems that are under threat and so understanding gerasite will help us to keep those but I came to this um, as a planetary geologist uh, because I quite like Mars and there's gerasite on Mars there's a lot of gerasite on Mars well, I hope there's a lot there's some um, so the star in the corner of this slide is to remind everybody that uh, or to remind myself to tell everyone that I apologize there will be gratuitous planetary images throughout this talk um, uh, tough get used to it pretty much. Um, so uh, we know that there's gerasite on Mars because of this guy. So Opportunity, actually this girl, I think she's a girl. Um, so Opportunity's primary mission was 90 days um, and they thought she might go a couple of hundred meters. So she went 45 kilometers and operated for 14 years and 46 days. And anyone who says they aren't sad, when weren't sad when she died is lying to you. Um, she advanced our knowledge of Mars greatly. 
Um, and one of the earliest things that uh, she discovered was gerasite using the Mossbauer instrument on her. So this picture in the background, um, if you actually look, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but if you can, that is the rover. Um, and this will take about high rise, it's a very nice image. Uh, this is Victoria Crater and you can see all the nice sand dunes in the middle. Um, so what so what uh, opportunity discovered near this crater was gerasite. So that was important because gerasite was the first hydrated mineral to be identified on the surface, um, which obviously made all of the astrobiologists go, hydrated, water, life, done. There's life on Mars. Obviously there isn't because there's gerasite, but you know, we'll give them that. Um, but it is interesting that gerasite is there because gerasites need a wet environment, wet, hydrated environment to form, but they need an arid one to be preserved. So the fact that we can see gerasite there is already telling us that the environment on Mars has changed. So if we can learn more about the mineral and how it, uh, how it forms and then how it survives its stability, then we can work out what's been going on and say something about the evolution of Mars. Um, so also, uh, Curiosity has also found uh, gerasite. So uh, this image on the right of the diffraction pattern is one of the most exciting images I've ever seen. This is diffraction from another planet. Um, and believe me when I say that one of those rings, there's only one, so in this image there's only one gerasite peak, uh, and in this particular sample there was 1.7% gerasite, that's enough, it's there. It's fine, it's there. Um, and so this was an exceptionally exciting uh, day when they found this out. Um, one thing I would like you to note about this image is that the beam stops one key. So apparently they got it there, they took their first image and went, oh. So they think that the beam stop moved in transit. Um, and it's fine, they cope, but they get a little bit more. Unfortunately, the, the signals of the clays that they were hoping to get are down in that really low angle area. So sometimes they get a little bit stuck with that, but um, they're managing, it's fine. Um, anyway, so I did this work as a postdoc at CSIRO, which is the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization here in Australia. Um, and they are not known for their amazing research into Mars and its minerals. Um, they are, however, known for their amazing research into industrial processing. So it turns out that gerasite turns up in a lot of um, industrial processes here on Earth. So in zinc purification, um, you get this process which is called the gerasite process, where they want to get all, they're trying to make zinc. So iron is an impurity. So they want to get rid of the iron from their processing solution as quickly as they can. So they throw a load of um, alkali in, it precipitates out gerasite, taking all the iron out so they can literally scrape it all off the top. Um, so in this case, they are trying to make gerasite and they're trying to make gerasite as quickly as they can. So for them, gerasite formation is good. However, it's not always good. So in bioleaching, um, so here we're trying to make copper from a low-grade ore. So you get a low-grade copper ore, you put it in a giant pile, you add some acid, you add some bacteria. Bacteria does its amazing thing, um, and it turns the copper into a form that, that it can then be extracted. Unfortunately, the bacteria does not know the difference between iron and copper. So what it does to the copper, it does to the iron. And so you get, uh, when it does that, you get a reaction with the acid and the heat and gerasite is formed. And so that forms a hard layer of gerasite, which means that the bugs, the bacteria, can't get to what they're actually supposed to be eating. Um, I use the term eating loosely, obviously. Um, so uh, in this scenario, gerasite formation is bad and they are trying to actively stop gerasite layers from forming so they don't have to shut down the heap and take the extract all the gerasite manually and then start to jump again. Um, so 
what do we want to know? Well, it turns out in each of these scenarios, so on Mars and in these industrial um, conditions, we want to know quite similar things. So if we're going to do some experiments into these industrial processes, we can also just change the conditions slightly or extend the range of the conditions slightly. And we're also on Mars, which is great for me and everyone else. Um, so the sort of things we want to know, we want to know how does the gerocyte form? How long does it take? Can we make, can we make it form quicker? What mechanisms control the formation? Can we promote them? Can we, um, can we suppress them? We want to know how long it's going to remain stable in the environment. Um, if it has different elements in it, what kind of, um, what different, what does that do to the stability? What does that do to the property, properties of the material? Um, and then for Mars in particular, we want to know if we can use terrestrial gerocyte deposits to learn things about Mars. So uh, we want to know um, if we can tell anything from the weathering of the gerocytes or the formations that we see, um, if we can then relate that back to processes that are happening on Mars. So I, as I said, I am a planetary geologist by training. So um, synthesis of gerocyte is very luckily for me, very easy. So you take sodium or potassium sulfate and iron sulfate and you stick it in water and you heat it a bit and gerocyte forms. So that's really nice and easy. Um, so because it's so easy, we can vary quite a lot of things. So we can vary those cations, we can vary the amount of iron, we can uh, put some seeds in to crystallize it, see if we can change the speed it crystallizes and the mechanisms, we can change the pH, we can change the temperature. So that, those are the things that we, we've all in, we've investigated. So we start off in the lab. So this is from an NL diffractometer. Um, and you can see it's one of those lovely uh, 2D diffraction patterns that diffraction people love to show and not explain. So along the bottom, you can see we've got uh, the two theta scale, as you would have for a, a normal pattern. And then along the right hand side, that we've stacked the diffraction patterns. So on the right hand side, as you go away from me, as if I were giving the talk, or you if you're looking at the talk, uh, that's time increasing. And you can see the peaks grow as the gyrocyte crystallizes and then grows. Um, so that's lovely. Um, we would always like more resolution in both time and two theta. Um, so we then went to the synchrotron. So this is the beam line that I work on, it's powder diffraction, uh, looking very shiny in our lovely panorama. So you can see um, we are, well, you can't see from this photo, but we are a bed magnet beam line. Um, so we are flux limited a bit. So we, um, we do what we can with um, a myelin detector. So we, until this year, we had vertically vertical focusing, but no horizontal focusing. And then this year we've put in um, new toroids on our BCM, on our vertically collimating mirror and our vertically focusing mirror. So now we can focus into both of our end, experimental end stations and get our flux up a bit. Um, and so the myelin detector is our main detector. We do, I would say, 80% of our experiment, or probably 90% of our experiments using the myelin detector. Um, so it's a silicon strip detector. Um, we are very interestingly watching for myelin 3 to come out, hopefully soon. That'd be nice. Um, and so most of our experiments are in capillaries. We also have setups for um, the battery samples and various other stress strain rigs, diamond anvil sounds and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not going to pitch the beamline to you. This is not that talk. Um, so for our experimental setup, so we want to see how, um, we want to look at the changes in situ for this material. So we're going to put our starting solution in our capillary. Uh, we're going to put a gas line on it so that when we heat it up, it doesn't all boil away. Um, then we're going to put it in basically in a traditional goniometer head, so like you might find on a lab machine or, or at the synchron. Um, and then our heater under here, I spent far too much time making this graphic today. 
but that's fine. Um, so we're going to heat it up with our hot air blower, um, hit it with the beam, and then collect data in the Mylan, which would be above us. Um, and we can do that. So we do that every uh, 30 seconds um, for these experiments because they're happening on this time scale of sort of hours. So this one is a particularly fast one because you can see the peaks start to grow immediately. So this is some of our exam example data and it looks very similar to our lab data, but with higher resolution. Um, and so you can see this one is 120 degrees because the peaks start to grow almost immediately. Um, and this is a matter of, this will be an hour. So these, are, these data sets are one minute apart. So that's over an hour, the reaction is basically complete and all the gyrocyte we're gonna get has grown in the capillary. Um, and so we get some nice, nice powder diffraction results. This is um, something that any beamline scientist will also show you, a comparison of uh, how good their instrument is compared to a lab instrument um, in this case for this setup and this sample. Uh, so you can see we've got, we, we're able to resolve some really nice peak splitting um, and yeah, our peaks are generally nicer, but you can still see in the lab, we could see some of the features that are starting to emerge. So, however, we weren't expecting the peaks to be split, which um, is not ideal when you start looking at your data and it doesn't look like it, it should. So we expect rhombohedral gyrocyte. So everyone, except one person, has reported rhombohedral gyrocyte. Um, but we get peak splitting. So you might look at these peaks and think, oh, they're characteristically split two to one. Maybe there's a lower of lowering of symmetry which is what has happened here. So we've got, we started off thinking we were gonna get monoclinic gyrocyte and we actually got rhombohedral gyrocyte. So that takes over the peak splitting, but we still have, oh, so I'll come back to why we still have more peaks in a minute. Uh, so if we go back to our gyrocyte structure, instead of having all the iron octahedra the same color because they're equivalent positions. Um, in this, in the monoclinic case, we have two different sites um, and you get ordering of vacancies preferentially on one of those two sites um, as you get monoclinic gerocyte. So back to that splitting, we still have too much splitting. Um, so uh, this is what, the one at the bottom is what our nice monoclinic gerocyte should look like. And then at the top is what we actually have with additional splitting. So what that actually is, is we have too much resolution. So we have uh, effectively the gyrocyte, if this is our capillary on the right here, our gyrocyte has formed on the outside. And so we're seeing the sample twice, which is fine. Um, and I'm not gonna go into much detail you know, about that. Um, because only I really care. Um, so for all our different types of gerocyte, we're able to look at how their structures changed with time and temperature and the things we've varied. So this plot here is the unit cell of the gerocytes uh, and how that changes as you go through time and as you go through temperature. So we can start to kind of really, what really matters from this picture is that it does not matter where all the things are, but we can start to deconvolve, we can start to sort out what gerocyte forms where, what will preferentially form, will it form quicker from this one, will it form quicker at this temperature, we can start to work out where everything is in our sort of, in our environmental space. And we also had a look at seeded gerocyte formation, and you can see that makes a huge difference. So in this one, it's seeded with diamond, and so the small things of the diamond and the big things are the gerocyte, um, which is very different to when we've seeded it with gerthite, where you can't tell which one's which, um, and they're much smaller. Um, and similarly with the hematite, these 
these kind of globules are, were hematite um, and the gerocytes just kind of swamped them. Um, and you can see there's a lot of difference going on here. So what else is in the environment is very important for gerocyte growth. Um, so what we were really interested in was looking at the crystallization and growth. Um, or the formation and crystallization and growth. So from the powder diffraction, we were able to look at the crystallization and growth stage. So um, if you look down here at this sodium at 80 degrees, you can see there's no data before 150. So that's because there's no crystalline peaks before 150 um, minutes, that is. Um, and so there's a lot of time here where something's going on, but then the crystallization really starts and then it grows. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to see if we could find out something about that really early region as well, because we can find, we can do the kinetics once it's crystallized, but not before that. So we thought, why don't we use SACs? So small angle X-ray scattering. So the reason we went for SACs is when we did those first lab um, this first lab experiments, we noticed that down here on the left in the small angle region, so right down at the lowest regions of 2 theta, you can see there's some changes in the background which seem kind of coincident with the, when that goes away when the peaks start to grow. So we thought we'd go and have a look at that. So we went to the small, angle, small and wide angle X-ray scattering beamline at the Australian synchrotron. Um, this picture is very out of date now. Um, so since this picture was taken, they have a new shiny vacuum end station. So on the left here, um, there's a giant chamber. Um, and uh, I have been informed that this is now the, uh, the beamline photo that is most accurate. Uh, compared to what I have. So uh, here are the lovely Saxwax team, and if anybody wants to know who is who at the end, I can let them know, uh, with their giant sample chamber. So rather than with the PD, we're looking at, we're looking at the structure of the material, we're looking at distances between atoms. So with the small angle scattering, we're looking at the particles. So in those really early stages, we're looking to try and see if we can see those, um, those particles growing um, or forming and growing. And so normally when I give this talk, this is the extent of the SACS results that I show. Um, however, we're doing a talk about SACS, so I'll give you a little bit more than that. So we can do simultaneous wax, so wide angle extra scattering, so powdered fraction at the same time. Um, and you can see these are the main peaks of gerocyte. So this is at the end of our experiment we've um we can use that to follow and make sure that we're getting the same kinetics that it's doing the same thing everything's behaving the same as it did when we did the powder diffraction which obviously it will but it's nice to be able to check these things um so that fancy 2d um picture where all the peaks grow for powder diffraction this is the equivalent for small angle scattering so the ripples are telling us something about particle and you can kind of see that they sort of move up as you go away, move up the uh, the slope as as time goes on, move down the slope as time goes on. Um, they move up and down the slope as time goes on pretty much. Um, and so we can we can look at that to tell us something about the shape of the particles that are that are in our solution. So we start off uh, we start off with a nice guinea region. So at this point, we can't tell anything about the shape of the particle. Uh, we just It just looks like it's a, a sphere. So we can say something about the size of that. Uh, then when we move on from that into that sort of, trust me when I say that there are waves in this graph. <laughs> this is the wavy region. So in the wavy region, uh, those different ripples are telling us something about the different the shape of the particle, so the different axes of the particle. So in our case, we're actually looking at a disk. So they're telling us something about how the disk grows. Um, and then we move into a parod region where, uh, and then eventually that moves up 
and then everything is too big for us to see what's going on. So we move, we're moving out, we move out of the length scale that we can see particles in the sacs. So those don't, so those plots in themselves are not very helpful, um, which is why we tend not to dwell on those. Um, so here you can see uh, one of our fitted sacs patterns, and you can see this correlates to this particle here. And so we can watch how the particle shape grows um, and changes. And it starts off quite spherical, and then they kind of flatten as they grow. Um, and we can we can track the ellipsoid volume and the different axes through time through these experiments as well. So from that we can start to correlate how it lines up with the with the pattern diffraction data and and you know one follows on nicely from the other. It is interesting though that we have quite a long time with these quite big particles before we see any diffraction, before we see crystalline um, material. Um, so that is something we're still trying, even this many years later, something we're still trying to understand. Um, but there is one big take home message from this experiment, which kind of surprised us when we worked it out. Um, so SACS relies on a monodisperse population of particles. So that it relies on the fact that everything is the same size. And if you think about real systems or real mineral systems, that's not always true. And it's not often true. And quite a lot of the time you get different size crystals and everything and different size particles and things kind of grow to accommodate the space. Um, but in this case, and in all the variations of this that we've done with different composition, different um, temperatures, different anything, anything you like, um, we do get have a monodispersed case. And so all the things that are growing are the same size. And they all start growing at the same time. And that's really important. So our huge take home message from this is that jarosite forms as a single nucleation event. So everything forms and then it all grows together. And we can we can kind of verify that by looking at the capillaries afterwards as well, just to check everything is the same size. Um, so that means that that is the key in those experimental process, experimental and industrial processes where you're trying to either enhance the jarosite or suppress the jarosite forming. That's the key. You, if you can control that nucleation step, then you can control everything about your process or everything about how you want the gerocyte to behave in your process. Um, so we think that's quite an interesting thing.